parable of the prodigal son is one of the most famous parables that Jesus told during his earthly ministry. But whenever someone refers to it, they do it that way. They talk about the prodigal son, singular. Um, but there are really two prodigals here in Luke, uh, Luke's account here in chapter 15. The first prodigal came home to his father expecting rejection, experiencing grace. And the other prodigal never left home ex- uh, expecting uh, recognition, but experiencing bitterness. In that regard, the elder brother is just as important as the prodigal brother, uh, perhaps even more. You see, there are two ways to be lost without God. One way is to break the rules and live your life just as you please, and that was how the younger brother lived his life, and uh, we know that he was lost. And the other way is to only strive to keep the rules and to be good. And this is how the elder brother lived, and he was lost too. So, and let me say today, please don't equate uh, being good with being saved. Uh, don't, don't do that, uh, because that's not how salvation comes. We, we understand that. If you are only being good to earn favor with God, my friend, then you are lost, if that's the only reason why. You see, the gospel is not be good and you will be saved. The gospel is be saved and you'll be good. That's the difference. The key to unlock this parable, I think, once again, I told you in the previous message, is the occasion of which Jesus spoke. He's speaking with the the scribes and the Pharisees. It says in verse 1 and 2, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Talking about Jesus. And as a result of that, Jesus responds um, with these parables. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were considered righteous, so to speak. And therefore, they did not associate themselves with uh, tax collectors or, or sinners. They're not going to be around them. God forbid that they would be around them. And Jesus is receiving sinners and he is eating with them. And it made it clear to the religious leaders of whose side he was on. That's the way they viewed it. And so Jesus showed them that they are not only wrong about him, but they are wrong about God. That's what Jesus is showing them. He gives these three parables. And uh, they all point to the same thing. I mentioned it last week, but it's important that I mention it to you again. All three parables point to lost people matter to God. That's important. Lost people matter to God. Now we've studied about the lost son, about the loving father. And now let's learn from the son who never left and where, where he was wrong. First of all, we see the elder brother erred in his position. You learn a lot about the elder when you uh, see his position or his relationship with the father. That, that's the key here in all of this. In the parable, Jesus identifies the older brother with the attitude of the Pharisees. They're un, they are unwilling to rejoice over sinners uh, being redeemed, being restored. They don't want to rejoice about that at all. Uh, First of all, we find he had a problem with his motives. In verse 25, now the elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what are the, what are these things, uh, what these things meant? And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf, but he was angry and would not go in. Now, the fact that the father had not consulted him about the party indicates that the older brother and the father had no relationship at all. Uh, And uh, on the elder brother's uh, part, anyhow, And when the elder brother hears that there is a celebration, he's angry, the Bible says, and he refuses to go to the party. And so there's some things that you quickly recognize here. 
you quickly recognize that he did not care about his younger brother coming home. He didn't care about that. Didn't care about his younger brother. He did not care about that which pleased the father. The father is happy. He's excited. He's celebrating about it. He didn't care about that. He didn't care about the glory of the father. He wanted the glory for what he had been doing. You will see as we study on and this. And he did what he did for what he could get out of it. That's what you see about this older brother. For years, the elder brother had managed to conceal his true feelings of resentment towards the, the father and the brother. All along, though, he had been wicked like his brother, only inwardly, not out, outwardly. He's just as wicked as the younger brother that went into the far country and uh, all the sinful things that he did. But this event exposed his real attitude. It showed just how wicked he was, even though in the eyes of people he might have been righteous, or right, or good, I should say. Solomon says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. But there was no love for the father here. There was no love for the brother. And the Bible tells us, that we measure our love for the Father by our love for our brother. And that's what the Bible says in 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? John is very clear about that. Second of all, we find that he had a problem with methods in verse 28, his methods. And he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Now, the elder brother, he's not going to celebrate and rejoice over his brother coming home uh, because he has no love for the brother nor the father. He doesn't, basically, he's frustrated with the father. He failed to understand unmerited favor. Uh, free forgiveness and deliverance from shame by the Father. He would not recognize that. He didn't want to see it. The scribes and the Pharisees, they would have applauded him for his uh, reaction. He acted self-righteously uh, like he's somehow or another holding up the, the honor of the family by reacting the way that he is reacting. He rejected the, re the brother's repentance and he saw his father's forgiveness of the younger brother as something that was shameful. Why would you do that? Why would you receive the brother back into the fold? Now this was speaking to the fact that the Pharisees didn't see, uh, didn't like Jesus as, as associating with sinners. Remember that's what it goes all the way back to the first of the chapter. They didn't like it because he was eating and uh, uh, conversing with sinners. He's, Jesus is bringing them to himself is what he is doing. Jesus is not involved with their sin. They needed the love of Jesus. They needed someone to point them the truth, the way. And Jesus was the truth and the way. Uh, so, uh, but this was speaking to the fact that these Pharisees didn't like Jesus associating with these sinners. And sinners were coming to repentance. So this elder brother, he is a hypocritical legalist doing what was expected of him on the outside, but I would tell you that on the inside, he is filled with secret sins, such as bitterness and hatred and uh, jealousy and uh, uh, anger and lust, all these things that are on the inside. And the truth is, he is just like uh, the lost brother, maybe not in appearance, but he's just as lost as his brother because he spend, spent his life in convincing himself and others that he is good and that he is morally upright. He didn't go to the far country. No, he didn't do that. And yet he was separated from the father and he needed to be restored. He separated from the father. And the fact that you hear me today, friend, that are here and those that are listening by means of live streaming because this is a powerful message for those who sit in the pews. But not just that, but maybe some good moral people in our community. 
The fact that you have never traveled to the far country, I'm talking about you never lived an openly wicked life like some people have. Maybe you've grown up in church and uh, you know, you've never done these uh, morally corrupt things in the eyes of people as far as the actions are concerned. The fact that you've never traveled to the far country does not mean that things are right between you and the Father. It doesn't mean that. You can be home but yet separated from the Father. You can be moral but yet unredeemed. You can be religious but lost. You can come to church every Sunday but be unsaved and you can be an inside outsider. You're on the inside with the church, but yet you're an outsider. You've never accepted Jesus. Your life has never changed. And I dare say that there are a lot of people like that today. A lot of people. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There be people that come and work. They work on uh, work night. Uh, they might teach a class, maybe even stand in the pulpit. You, you know, we can go right on down the line that one day they're going to stand before God and they're going to give an account because they never had a relationship with the Father. It was never there. Never really saved. Never accepted Christ. You know, um, maybe outwardly they look good, but on the inside, just as wicked as the prodigal son. Prov uh, verse 28 says, His father came out and pleaded with him. Now this is a beautiful picture of the incarnation where the Lord leaves his home in heaven to come to our home on earth to invite us to come back to his home in heaven. It's a wonderful picture here. The Father's actions symbolize God and uh, in, in, in Jesus Christ pleading with the sinner to come to salvation. It's a picture of this. And this is the second time in the same day this father is bearing the shame of his son's actions and he is demonstrating, as you're going to see, and as we saw our heavenly father last week, what a wonderful message that was about the, the father re re representing our heavenly father. But you're going to see in the message today how he demonstrates his selfless love in order to reconcile both of these prodigal sons. He loves both of them. And trying to bring them home. Come home. Won't you come home? Second of all, we see the elder brother erred in his pride. Because of the elder brother's pride, the dad had to leave the celebration with the town dignitaries there that have come um, there to, to speak of his son. Uh, he has to leave all that and uh, in order to go out there because of his son's pride. His pride was on display in two ways. First of all, he was filled with self-righteousness in verse 29. And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Now three words reveal the elder brother's heart here. You notice it. It's in that one verse. I, me, my. That's the three words you'll find there. And this is the testimony of one who is religious but lost. Everything centers around them. It's all about me. It's always been about me. It'll always be about me. That's the way some people are in our world, but we know that it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about him, and it will always be about the Lord Jesus Christ. It always will be. And so the elder brother viewed serving the father as slavery. He did the right thing with the wrong attitude, right in the eyes of people, but he had a wrong attitude. And God is not just looking at what you do. He is looking, Christian, at why you do it. That is very important. Why do you do what you do? And there is no love or respect for his father you find here. 
merely toil and, and drudgery uh, waiting for him to die so that he could receive the inheritance. That's the only thing that he is concerned about. It becomes very clear that he wanted exactly what his younger brother wanted, all that he could get of the estate for himself. He just chose a different path in order to get it. You know, he's just as wicked. He's just chosen a different path. I like what Thomas Adams once said. <clears throat> Self-righteousness is the devil's masterpiece to make us think well of ourselves. Now, in a classic expression of self-righteous hypocrisy, the elder brother here exclaimed, I never transgress your commandment. This is what he's saying. Can you imagine all Dacia telling his dad that? This is what he's saying. He's saying the elder brother, uh, he, he, he did not do what the elder, the prodigal son did. However, I want you to know that did not mean that he had ever done nothing wrong. That's what he is exclaiming here. He, he was so focused on his brother's mistakes, his sinful life, that he could not see that he had sin in his own life. That's what he could not see. What child can honestly say that he or she have never disobeyed? Now, none of y'all young people better not raise your hand in here because we know better than that. And you know what, mom and dad, you did the same thing. There's not one of us that can say that we have never disobeyed our parents. And yet this is, a, this is what the elder brother is, is claiming. He's claiming this, and it is the self-righteousness of a respectable sinner is what it is. But, no, but hear me today, no one has always obeyed God. Nobody has done that. The psalmist said it well when he said, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? You know, who among us could stand? And the answer is no one. That The only one who never disobeyed is the one who is telling this parable, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one on this earth that's never disobeyed. You see, the elder brother was not righteous, he was only a different kind of sinner, is what he was. And listen to him. He said, you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. The elder brother served for a reward, not a relationship. He's not interested in a relationship with the father. He wants a reward. And he thought he deserved more than he received. Man, what an indictment here. This is, this is a blinding effect of pride that he would take this attitude. Listen to me today, friend. With this attitude of this elder brother, listen today. You don't want today for God to give you what you really deserve. You don't want that. None of us want that because we all deserve to be on the road to hell is what we deserve. We don't deserve the goodness uh, of, uh, of Almighty God, but I'm glad we serve, we serve a good God a loving God, a merciful God, and he is good to us. But the elder brother did not know what made the father's heart beat. and He could have known, he should have known, but he didn't know. He didn't know it. He didn't want to know. So we find also he is filled with self-gratification. Verse 29 again. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the cat fatted calf for him. Now this man didn't even care about the father. He did what he did for what he could get out of it. That's why he's doing what he is doing. He didn't serve the father out of love for the father, but out, uh, out of a desire to help himself. That's all he wants. And notice the bitterness. I want you to, uh, you can underline or highlight there, uh, these words are very important. These many years, that really indicates something there. This son goes off on his father and this is not some momentarily fit of passion or anger that has come out in him. No, my friend, 
This is, a, uh, this is an expression of long-standing bitterness that's been going on for a long time. These many years, he has been bitter. He was not just angry because of the father's response to the prodigal's return. No, he'd been angry with the father for many years. There are people, I'm here to tell you that they have no relationship with God because they will not let go of these many years. I'm actually dealing with someone right now in this same situation. Some are know they walked away from God these many years. They've not been with God. They're in bondage to something that happened yesterday. I mean, I'm talking about maybe they didn't get the job that they wanted or maybe they didn't get the man or the woman that they wanted or maybe God didn't heal them of this disease or maybe God didn't spare their loved one, their life. I don't know what it might be. And so they resent God and they say God is not fair. And so they walk away from God because of these things. Hey, why don't you ask John the Baptist if life is fair? You know, we're going to be on the cruise, some of us, and studying about the life of Apostle Paul. And we're going to talk about uh, the difficult times that he had. We're going to talk about his conclusion and stand right there, uh, go down into the cave of where he served his last days in that prison. Uh, ask the Apostle Paul if you, you think life is fair. I, I want to say about this, my friend, I think it's important. If it is what God wills, then yes, it is fair. It is fair, just not necessarily by our standards. If God says it, then yes, we accept whatever God says. God knows what he is doing. John C. Broger says, anger and bitterness are two noticeable signs of being focused on self and not trusting God's sovereignty in your life. By the way, if you can say these many years and you're angry with God about these things, maybe it's because you don't know God. Maybe you have no relationship with him. It seems that the elder brother has an issue with the prodigal son, but the problem is with the father is where the real problem is. I think he could be described by the apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 when, he, when Paul is describing the pagan nation, I think it fits the elder brother when Paul said, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. I think the prodigal's, uh, the elder son, was just like what Paul described there of those pagan nations. And although the elder son lived with the father, he never really knew his heart or he never really gave thanks for the blessings. Instead, he became bitter. He's just bitter about these things. The elder brother would not even uh, recognize the younger brother, the prodigal son, as his brother. He calls him this son of yours. That's the way he talks to him, to, to the father. This son of yours, he doesn't even address him as his brother. He thinks that when the prodigal came home, the father should have turned, turned him away. This is what he is thinking. Spiritual re people respond to a father, a fallen brother with restitution, not amputation. Uh, we, we ought to have Christian love and bring that uh, person, if they're lost, bring them to the Lord. If they know the Lord, but they've fallen into sin, that we do what we can in order to restore that brother or sister in the things of the Lord. That's important that we do that. We don't, we don't amputate them. We don't cut them off. Uh, we do our best to bring them back to the Lord. His life was only about himself and his self-gratification, self-righteousness, self-centeredness, self-pity. That's the man that he was. His actions graphically picture the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus is pointing this out. It, it, it gives a, a picture of them. They're unrepentant, self, self-righteous, self hypocritical externalists, choosing to, uh, to insult and scorn Jesus Christ, God incarnate, for, recon for reconciling sinners whom all Jewish religious society had rejected. 
That's what they're looking down on him in scorn at, that he restores these sinners. And I want to remind you that this parable is intended to reveal the immeasurable grace of God and the glory of the Father in his invitation to the banquet hall of salvation. That's what it's all about. And the point is that grace isn't a reward, it's a gift. Remember that, friend. Not a reward, it is a gift. Then last of all, we find the elder brother erred in his priorities. Prodigal son had a great awakening about his father in a far country. The elder brother never had a great awakening that we know of. He did not leave the father's house and yet he misunderstood the father's heart. There's two areas that he failed in regard to his father. First of all, he failed to see the goodness of his father. In turn, he failed to see the goodness of God. Verse 31 he said to them, he said to him, the father speaking, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. The elder brother's tirade dishonored his father, disowned his brother. He's throwing a fit there. And yet the father responded to him with affection. And he calls him son. Son, you're always with me. You're my son. After being treated uh, uh, by the father in such love that the elder brother, he comes back angrily at the father again. And after being insulted, the father is still not angry with the brother. Now I'm going to tell you, this is a great example of the grace of God. How many of you there were living a life of sin and God sent those to you to witness you, maybe a faithful husband, a faithful wife, or a faithful uh, son or daughter or mom or dad that witnessed to you and you continuously rejected God? You insulted Almighty God with your attitude of rejecting Him? But our God still loved you. He loved us even when we rejected Him. That's the grace of God. That God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we're yet still sinners, Christ died for us. The attitude, the ugly attitude we have still loved us. Still died on the cross for us. Here you see God loves the elder brother just as much as he loves the prodigal. He loves both. The father explains how much the elder brother mattered to him by affirming his presence and his property. First of all, the father said, son, you're always with me. You're always with me. And more important than, than parting with friends, my friend, is to be in the presence of the father. Oh, if we could ever get to the day that we understand the material things of this world mean nothing, the thing that is important is having a relationship with the father. That's the important thing. Sometimes it takes people a, a whole lifetime to come to the point to understand having a relationship with the Father is more than all the things of this world. The Father had never forsaken the elder brother. Unlike the prodigal son, the elder brother had never forsaken the Father. I say he never forsook the Father, but he was with him but not with him at the same time. You understand what I'm saying? He might have been there physically, but he certainly wasn't there spiritually. His body was home, but his heart was somewhere else. He failed to see what a blessing it was to be with the Father. And I submit to you today, once again, there is nothing better than being with the Father. Nothing. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand, the psalmist said. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. The wickedness. Likewise, the father said, he goes on to say, son, all I have is yours. All I have is yours. Not just some fat calf and not some roast beef dinner with some live music. He's saying this, this meal is all your brother has at this moment. 
He's starting all over. This is all he has. He's saying to him here, look, what well, this is a how, how can you compare this celebration with all that you have? You're the heir. You're the one that has it all. All that I have is yours. How could I possibly give you more? That's what the father is saying to this elder son. He has lost nothing because of the brother's return. Just because God is blessing someone else, it doesn't mean that our God has forgotten you. At this point, the father is being kind because the the prodigal son has come home. I, I see some people that they're jealous or whatever. They see that God is blessing. We ought to rejoice in that. It may be a period of time that we're going through. It's a tough time and we might not see the blessings that we would like to see in our own life, but let's rejoice in those that God is blessing. Let's praise God for that. Let's rejoice in that. But I want you to remember in all that, it doesn't mean that God has forgotten you because if you are in Christ, remember this Christian, that all that the Father has is is yours. Remember that. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember you're going to heaven one day. Remember that your rewards will be there in heaven. Christians a lot of times act like they want their reward here in this life. Friend, our reward is waiting for us in heaven. Let's live for God. Let's be faithful to God. And if you are grateful, you can give thanks to God for the gifts that he is giving to other people. Thank the Lord for that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with many, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Rejoice in that. But let me see also he failed to see the, not only the goodness of God but the gladness of God. Failed to see his, his father being glad. Verse 32. And it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So the elder brother deemed it wrong that the father threw a party for the returning prodigal and the father deemed it natural and necessary to celebrate. His lost son had been restored and so he's glad. His dead son has been resurrected and he is glad. It is only right to celebrate and be glad. When people come to know Christ, we ought to celebrate and be glad. It ought to be an exciting thing. It is a blessed thing. But in the midst of the goodness and gladness of the father stands a striking picture of the legalistic older brother here. He stood in the dark condemning his gracious father who at the same time was being honored at the joyous celebration of his lost son's recovery. Have you ever noticed that this story is an open-ended story? Have you ever noticed that? Did the elder brother ever come to the feast? We don't know. It's an open-ended story. And I really do think that Jesus left it that, left it that way for a reason, and here's the reason. Every individual must write his or her own ending to this story. Every person must do that. For Israel, the story ended badly. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ presented presented himself to the nation of Israel as their long-awaited Messiah, and yet he came to them as a fulfillment to their ancient prophecies, and they knew who he claimed to be, but yet they refused to receive him as their Messiah, as their Lord, and as their Savior. They refused to do that. And in this story, the elder brother represents the religious leaders of Israel. They refuse to come to the feast. They refuse his offer of a heavenly banquet where where we will praise God for all eternity for our salvation. They refused all this, my friend. No, they murdered Jesus because they would not have him rule over them. And when Israel crucified their king and turned their cold heart to uh, uh, to the father, their heart went cold toward him. They wrote their own ending to the story is when they did that. So how will the story end for you is the question today. Do you have a real love for God the Father in heaven? Friend, do you have a real love for God the Father today? 
You may be a church member, but you are lost if there's no relationship between you and the Father. If there's no relationship, friend, you're lost today. Please don't stay outside in the dark listening to the celebration. Come in and be a part of it. The heart of God celebrates every time one person comes home to him from the far country. Join the party, friend. It's a real party of celebration. I read about a man, a young man, who came up with an ingenious way to pass the final exam of his college level logic class and the class is known uh, for its difficult test. To help them on the test, the professor told them that they could bring as much information um, to the exam that they could fit on a piece of notebook paper. And so the students began to cram as much information on that eight and a half by 11 piece of paper on that sheet of paper, as much as they could put on there, as small as they could write that they could see it, they put on there. But one student walked into the class, put a piece of notebook paper on the floor, and had an advanced logic student stand on that paper. And the advanced logic student told him everything that he needed to know. And he was the only one in the class receiving A. He'd done just like what the teacher had told him. But friend, I'm here to tell you today, I know the one who knows it all. And he is the creator and the sustainer of life. He is the redeemer of mankind. And I know him, and I have a relationship with him. He, we are his bride, and he, and he is our bridegroom. And I love the way that John tells it of the, in the days to come. John the Revelator there tells of things to come and he says, talking about all those that are going to be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He says, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. That's all we who know Christ. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Thank God. Only those who have a relationship with the Father will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. My friend, don't think that your self-righteousness will get you to heaven because it won't. I'm deeply concerned about people in our churches all across the world that say they know God, but they really don't know God. I'm deeply concerned about that. Your self-righteous life won't get you there. It is only by your repentance and your acceptance of Jesus Christ who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary for your sins. It's the only way you're going to get to heaven. No other way. Your good works will not get you there. We have churches all through the city of Winter Haven that are teaching good works to heaven. Religions all around the world teaching good works get to heaven. Friend, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus Christ.